good morning. How you guys doing? Awesome, man. Great to have you guys. Great to see you. If this is your first time or if you came to Easter uh, last Sunday and decided to come back and uh, check us crazy people out, um, you, we are so glad that you did and believe that God has something for you this morning. Uh, if you're looking for a home church, we'd love to give you any information that you might uh, want to know about. Um, we are starting a, a new series this morning called Family Foundations, where uh, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of those topics this, this morning. We're going to focus on the topic of marriage, um, and, and I'll get to that in just a moment. If you're not married, it's okay. I'll still give you some principles that'll help you walk out of here uh, even this morning. And then next week, we're going to focus on parenting. Um, and so we'd love to have you come back and uh, walk through that with us as well. And then the next week, we're going to talk about the next generation and the responsibility that we have even as a church and that all of us have um, to the next generation. And whether you believe it or not, even if you don't have kids, we still have a responsibility to the next generation. And so, um, and then the last week of foundations, uh, we're actually going to talk about money. So if there's one not to come to, just decide not to come to the one on money, okay? <laughs> if you don't want to hear the pastor talk about money. We'll be talking about stewardship that day, a foundation of stewardship that God wants to build um, into our lives. And so just really excited about that. Um, we, uh, we always take the first uh, Sunday of every month uh, here at Crosswinds and talk about defining moments and where we're at. If you're like, what is defining moments? Uh, defining moments is a two-year initiative that we started back in November of last year. We went through a six-week series talking about defining moments where we looked at different uh, passages of Scripture, uh, different uh, stories in the Bible where there was these defining moments in the lives of individuals that changed the trajectory of their life, that changed them forever. Um, and we believe that we are in one of those defining moments in the life of our church. Uh, we started realizing real quick last year that we were outgrowing the space that we were in, that God was, um, ex that God was expanding our territory. Um, and so as many of you know, we went to three services in January um, and have seen growth since then where we've been averaging around 680 to about 700 people on a, on a regular basis um, on a Sunday. Yeah. And then... And then last Sunday, we actually hit our largest attendance ever by, we hit a thousand, over a thousand people just last Sunday on Easter Sunday. And so, yeah, we're really excited about that. You're like, well, you, you know, you're only excited because of the numbers. Well, God wrote a whole book about numbers. And, and so, no, what it is, is that we celebrate the fact that God enabled us to have the opportunity to share the gospel with, about, with over a thousand people. And it's really neat. I actually had one person who came to me just this morning and said, thank you. She said, my daughter was here and she walked away needing to hear uh, about the peace that Jesus can give to us. And I'm just really celebrate that. Um, but we always want to try and share some stories um, about what God's doing in connection with defining moments and, and why we do what we do. Because we believe it's not about expanding the building. It's not about money. It's not about, um, you know, uh, making a bigger building. But it's about the mission that God has given to us. Um, that's what Defining Moments is. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen some really neat things happen. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a guy by the name of Dean who came in to the church. His first time here. He drove by, said, hey, for whatever reason, I felt like I needed to come here. He's from New York. He didn't even live here. Um, presently, he didn't even live here. Drove by, he came in, and that morning, Dean gave his life to Christ for the first time. What was really cool was that he was, I was sharing that morning about, uh, about how the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son in the Bible and about how the son got the inheritance from his dad and went out and he squandered, he wasted everything. And what Dean said was, he said here, I think he said, he told me his age, which was like in his 60s. He said, I've wasted my life. And he said, but I, and he said, I see my kids wasting their life and I don't want them to do the same thing. 
and just to see Jesus really working in Dean's life and now the opportunity that he has to influence his kids. And so that's really cool. Then we had another lady by the name of Deb who shared a story with me just a few weeks ago. As some of you know, a few months back toward the end of the year, first of the year, we had a prayer wall up on either side where people would write prayers and bring them up. And we were praying bold. It was a series called Bold Prayers. Well, Deb brought her prayer up and she was praying for her husband um, to come to salvation and to come to know the Lord. And she came up a couple of weeks ago and she's like, where'd all those prayer cards go? And I said, well, we took them off the wall and we stuck them in the answered prayer bucket because we've been, we believe that in 2024 that God's going to answer those prayers. And she said, well, I just wanted you to know that this past Wednesday, my husband gave his life to Christ. And he's in the hospital and probably at the end stages of his life. And so thankful that he came to that realization. I actually had the opportunity to go up and see him a couple of weeks ago um, after that situation and, and just really trusting that um, God's just taking care of him while he's there. So we just celebrate that. We also just want to give you an update on where we are financially and since it is a, uh, an initiative to raise funds to continue to move forward in the building uh, of a new sanctuary. Um, we'll be building a new sanctuary and this building will be turning into to all youth and children. So we're excited about that as an investment into our next generation as well. But this is where we are financially in raising. We've raised 700, over $750,000 to this point. So thank you for your giving. Um, if you've committed to the initiative, thank you for your giving to that. We're at like 16.3% of uh, our goal um, over the course of the two-year period. It goes to the end of 2025. Um, so we're 16.3. We should be at about like 16.8. So we're just a little behind, but it's, it's good. It's great. Um, just want to encourage you. Hey, if you don't give to Crosswinds Church and you call Crosswinds your home, um, I want to encourage you just to consider consider that what that might look like um, for you to start trusting the Lord with your finances. And we'll talk about that in a couple weeks if you want to come back and hear an even more extensive sermon on, on that part of it as we steward our resources. Um, and then also, if, if you give, but you haven't committed to defining moments, I just I'd encourage you to consider what it might look like for you to make a commitment to defining moments over the, over the rest of the period of time that we have left. Um, maybe God might want to use you to do something. So we're just really excited about that. So we're going to talk about marriage this morning. Um, and yeah, thanks, Daryl. Good job. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we got one per per person excited about it. All right. Are the rest of you guys excited about it? Yes. Some of you are like, well, I'm not even married. And uh, it's okay. What I believe is, is that as we walk through Nehemiah chapter 4 this morning, if you have your Bibles, want to open up Nehemiah chapter 4. I believe that what Nehemiah actually gives us some life principles, but I think they're really, they're also give us the ability to apply them to our life. So maybe even in relationships, maybe you're here this morning and you're young and you haven't married and you hope to get married at some point. This is a great place from a foundational standpoint to begin to work toward if you hope to get married married. Even if you're here and you're not married and you say, I'm never going to marry again, um, it's okay that uh, we believe that this is even foundationally can help you as you continue to move forward in whatever it is that God has for you in the days. But this morning, I will focus mainly on those of us who are married this morning and what hopefully we can begin to do to build a foundation, um, a family foundation that is built built on um, who Jesus is. And that's what we find uh, in the scripture. There were a couple things that I just want to make as statements that I believe are foundational to what we uh, know to to know to be true. These are not opinion statements. These are biblical statements that um, we know to be true about who God is and his design for marriage. And so I'll say this, the traditional structure of marriage and family is attempting to be deconstructed by the enemy and our culture. Okay, let me say that again. The traditional structure of marriage and family is attempting to be, and may, maybe I should even add biblical, the traditional and biblical structure of marriage and family is attempting to be deconstructed by the enemy and our culture. Okay. The second thing is this, is that marriage as designed by God is to be between a 
One biological man and one biological woman. Okay? These are not political statements. These are biblical statements. They are statements at which this church will believe in, and they are statements at which the church will stand on. Okay? There may come a day, and it may be sooner than what we like to believe, but I know that if I make those statements, or those statements potentially go public, it could not go so well for me eventually. But I'll tell you this, I'll always stand on the truth. You may have to bail me out of jail, but I'm okay with that. Okay? Because I'm... Don't, hey, this, don't, don't applaud me because I'm just doing what God called me to do, right? And the reality of it is he's called us all to do the exact same thing, right? We have to stand on the foundation. Here's what I will say, though. Don't expect the culture to act Christian when they're not Christian. Okay, so we have to understand that. We have to be able to, 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 to distinguish between what is biblical and what's not biblical. And that's really important. And so this morning, I wanted to establish a foundation for us that marriage was designed by God at the very beginning of creation between Adam and Eve. And it was meant even to be the same thing today between one biological man and one biological woman. And I had to put the biological piece in there. Okay? Um, just so that we're clear. John 10, 10 said that the enemy says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And essentially, that's what the, the culture is trying to do. The enemy uh, and the culture is trying to destroy marriage, is trying to, to destroy your family, is trying to destroy your kids, is trying to destroy everything around you. If the, if, the, if the devil can do anything, he's trying to destroy everything around you, especially, especially if you're running after biblical things. Yep. And so you have, to, you have to understand that. And what I love about the song that we just sing, sang is that even the demons flee at the name of Jesus. Okay? And so whether you want to believe in the spirit world or not, that's up to you. But I'm just going to tell you that the enemy is doing everything he can to come after you in, on all levels. And you just have to know that. Because John 10, 10 says the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's just not even just trying to come to wound you. He's trying to come to kill you. But the scripture says, that, and Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Now, here are some of the biggest challenges in marriage. The, biggest, the three biggest challenges in marriage are this, communication, money, and sex. Those are the three biggest challenges when it comes to marriage. I, I sit down, I do marriage counseling very rarely um, <laughs> because I'm not good at it. And my, uh, my, you know, one of, the, one of the first things I always sit down with people when they've asked me to marry them is one, I've got to spend at least six sessions with you trying to help you understand, you know, what you're actually getting ready to do. And my first thing is, I'm not a counselor. I know enough to be dangerous. And my response to you will be, um, suck it up, buttercup, and let's get, uh, get over it and let's go, Right? Because I think probably if we said that more often, um, it might help us. But what I know to be true is that we all carry baggage into our relationship. Y'all like my bags, don't you? This is not mine. This is my wife's. I'm not a red fan. I'm a Carolina blue fan, okay? Okay. You can cheer for that. It's okay. But, oops, don't want my baggage to get out. But the reality of it is, is that we all carry baggage into our relationship. Even if you grew up in a healthy situation, which much like Ashley and I, both of our parents were, um, were together, uh, didn't go through divorce, and so we were able to see some healthy systems within ours. But the reality of it is, is that the majority of us nowadays in the culture, there are actually more people who came from a blended or divorce situation than there are from a non-divorce situation. 
And so the reality of it is that, is that we're all really in the same boat because we all come bearing baggage. It's really interesting, uh, Ashley and I, we, we talk about it quite frequently, is that, that that first couple of years was really difficult for us. And we even, I mean, we went through counseling before we got married. We, we had parents that stayed together and even talked to us about those kind of things. But we realized that the first few years of marriage, they were pretty tough. Now, the average marriage nowadays lasts about eight years. It lasts about eight years. And, and what happens is, and what they actually say is that it's not, most of the time it's not till actually year nine or 10 that you actually start to get to know each other. Yeah. And so what's happening in marriages nowadays is that before they even get to that point, they're, they're ending before you actually are getting, really getting started. And then we know what we know to be true about that is that if it doesn't last eight years, then a lot of times there's a second marriage. And in the second marriage, the average uh, length of it is about three years. And then the more that you get, the more that that happens, the less it gets. Because the part of the reality of it is, is that I believe we're not dealing with the baggage in our life. Because we're all bringing baggage into our life. There are things that we saw our parents do or not do that caused us to bring baggage into our life. Yeah. Right? I, I can remember uh, my parents were older. I was like a, a, an oops baby. Oops. We had a baby. And I was like, well, you didn't know how that happened kind of thing. Um, and I can remember my dad... He would walk in the house. He, he would work all day. Um, he would walk into the house. He would walk, if it was dinner time, he'd walk right up to the table and he'd sit down and he'd wait. And my mom would have dinner ready. She would make his plate and bring it over and put it at his, put it at his plate. And when he was done, he got up and walked away and the plate stayed there. And my mom came over and did the dishes. The first time my wife saw, saw that happen, she looked at me. And she said, don't even think that's going to happen to you. <laughs> right? And so that was a little bit of an unhealthy structure, a pattern in my life that I had to realize that it was just very different. It was a cultural difference. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm not saying it was right. Okay? So if that's you and you're the husband, you better get your butt off the... Take your plate and do the dishes, all right? Um, but there are things we saw our parents do or not do. There were past hurts. There are past hurts that we bring in that we never dealt with. All of us, okay? And you're like, well, that, if you're sitting there thinking, well, this is not for me, then this is probably for you, okay? There are past hurts that we never dealt with because what we like to do as individuals is stuff it in the bag and never actually really deal with it. And what God says is actually, if you bring it to the light, that's where healing actually begins. Amen. Okay? So my desire for this series is for us to bring stuff to the light so we can actually find healing in it. I'm not saying you've got to come talk to me. Don't come talk to me for counseling. There are poor, cho poor choices, the baggage that we bring. There are poor, cho poor choices we made that we never worked through. Because whether you like to, to believe it or not, as a teenager, you probably made some pretty poor choices. As a college student, you probably made some pretty poor choices. As a young adult, you probably made some pretty poor choices. And if you didn't actually work through those things, then you bring them into a relationship and into a marriage. And what eventually happens when you don't deal with it, it eventually explodes. The baggage eventually becomes opened. I've actually realized that with some couples, um, there have been couples who've been married for 25, even 35 years, and their kids are all grown up, their kids move out of the house, and they realize that they, and they end up getting a divorce after 25 years because they realize they never even knew the person that they, they were living with. And that happens. It happens. There are unrealistic expectations that we bring into a marriage. 
You know, most of us, if we got married at a young age, which that was, that was me, I like to say I was young. I was 24, Ashley was 22 at the time. And, you know, I thought I had a picture of what marriage was. And when I walked into it, I realized about two, three years into it, this is not what I signed up for. And God had to begin to help me. Fortunately, at that point in those early years, Ashley and I had already made the decision, hey, listen, till death do us part. Regardless of how difficult it is, regardless of how hard it is, we'll fight for this for the rest of our life because we know that this is what God's called us to. Okay? So there are cycles and patterns that I believe this morning need to be broken. Uh, It doesn't matter if you've been married one year. It doesn't matter if you've been married for 25 years or 55 years. If those things haven't been broken and you don't feel like you're in a place that you've been healed because of those things, then this morning you need to begin the process of finding hope and healing in a relationship. And why do I say that? I have parents who lived together for 65 years. And at about year 64, 63 or 64, some stuff came to the light that they had stuffed away for 64 years and it just about exploded. It just about exploded. And to be honest with you, my parents died. My dad was 87. My mom was 84. They died within about a year and a half of each other. And to be honest with you, I think it was the guilt and shame that actually killed them. Some things came to the light that they had buried for so many years. And I think because they had been in it so long, they didn't know how to deal with it. And I believe it actually killed them. The hurt and the pain of it actually hurt them. So I believe there's some structures that need to be broken, some cycles and patterns that need to be broken this morning. So look at Nehemiah chapter four. Uh, Nehemiah is, uh, he's a cupbearer to the king. He has seen the destruction of Jerusalem. He has seen that the Israelites, there's only a remnant. The Babylonians have pretty much come into Jerusalem and they've destroyed it. Um, And they've torn down the walls. They've torn, torn the city apart. And at one point, Nehemiah finds out about this. In Nehemiah chapter one, Nehemiah finds out about it. He, he goes and he sees it. And in Nehemiah chapter four, it says that he, when he saw it, when he heard it, he wept. He wept. And then he began to fast and pray. And what we believe is that for three months that Nehemiah wept and he fasted and he prayed for God to use him to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And so he began to fast and pray and ask the Lord to give him favor with the king because he was cupbearer to the king. So he couldn't really just, he couldn't just leave what he was doing and go start helping to rebuild the walls. He had to have the favor of the king to actually be able to leave his position as the cupbearer and go. And so he prayed for that favor. And one day God opened that opportunity and he asked the king if he could leave and the king granted him favor and, and Nehemiah leaves. And he goes and then he begins to organize the people and put them together to begin to rebuild the walls. And what we know to be true is that they believe that he, they rebuilt the walls in about 52 days. The walls of the city of Jerusalem. But in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, they have begun this process. Now in the, in, on the few early verses of Nehemiah chapter 4, you actually see that opposition came against Nehemiah because he was wanting to do what was right. And here's what I'll say to you about that. If you desire for your relationships, even your relationship with God, your relationship with other people, your relationship with your husband or your wife, your relationship with your kids, if you desire and come to this this place where you want it to be better, where you want God to, to let it get to a healthy place, I promise you the enemy will get me against you. And you will have people in your life who will try and keep that from actually happening. (laughs) I believe we live in a culture where people don't want, people don't want people to be happy. Right? Hurt people, hurt people. And there's only, 
most of the time in our relationships, only those close people are the ones. And sometimes those close people don't even want you to be healthy because they're not healthy. So we're getting deep in the weeds this morning. And so in Nehemiah chapter 4, it says this, verse 13, it says, Therefore I stationed some of the people. So Nehemiah gets all the people together. He's got some opposition, but he works through that. And now he starts to put some people in place. He says, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. These people who were wanting to try and stop what was going on. Don't be afraid of the Babylonians because we're, we're rebuilding the walls. But I love this verse. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Amen. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And then he goes on to say, and fight for your what? Families. Fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and for your homes. And when our, en when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, Amen. that's what I love. God frustrates the plan of the enemy. He frustrated it. We all turned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever, when, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will what? Fight for us. So we continued the work with half of the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that, at that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve, as, uh, serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor, nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Man, this has got some incredible principles for us. Not only as individuals, you can take every principle that I'm going to give you this morning that comes from this passage and you can apply it to you personally or you can also take it and apply it to your relationships this morning. So the first thought is this, is that we have to make Jesus the foundation, right? He said, remember the Lord who is awesome, who is great and awesome. And so what he's trying to help the people reminded, remember what, who God is, remember what he has done, remember what he can do. And the only way for us to have successful, healthy relationships is for us to have a foundation that's built on Jesus. That's the only way. That's the only way that our relationships, you can look at relationships all over our culture, and the only ones that are actually truly healthy are the ones that are being built on the foundation of Jesus. And let me just say this, the problem in the church is that we're not building our foundations on Jesus. And that's where I think it has to begin to change for us. If you want your life to be healthy, build your life on Jesus. But here's what Jesus will do. He will start to unpack the crap in your life right. if you'll let him. So we have to make Jesus the foundation. The second thing is this, is that they fought their, for their families, right? He said, he said, okay, remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your families, Fight for your sons and daughters, and we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Fight for your homes. And so what we have to realize is that we have to fight. It takes work 
to be healthy in a marriage relationship. We have to fight for that because the enemy is trying to do everything he can to destroy a godly, biblical marriage. The enemy is trying to do everything he possibly can, and we're going to have to fight the enemy to have a family foundation that's built on Jesus. We ha- and then what I, here's what I love. Not only did the families, not only did he say but that the families fought for their sons and daughters, but then he said the other families fought too. So here's what I love about that, is that we saw a picture In the rebuilding of the wall, not only was the family fighting for their own family, but they were fighting for the families around them. It said it took the families and he, he placed them in the gaps in the wall. And my question to you this morning is who is it that's fighting for your family? What I love about and what I know to be true about my parents is that almost every time I saw my parents, they would say, hey, Chris, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for your family. My grandmother, every time I see her, Nana, she lived to be 99 years old. And I would go in, and she, her husband died at 50, and from probably about the age of 50 all the way till 90, as she got older in the years, she didn't get around as much. She'd sit in her recliner, and she was in this like little, little town home, and we'd go in there, and I'd kneel beside her, and she'd say, Hey, boy, she say, I prayed for you today. And she said, you keep preaching the word. You keep preaching the word because I'm praying for you and I'm praying for your family. And here's what I wonder. Are we a generation that's praying for our kids? Are we parents and grandparents that are praying for our kids? Are we building a foundation of faith? But also, are we praying for each other, right? Now, I expect everybody in your circle to pray for you, but you should have some other families that are praying for your family, right? Maybe you grew up in a system where your parents didn't bring you to church. They didn't teach you about what it meant to have faith. They didn't teach you about what it meant to go to church. Then find somebody who does and, and bring them into, the, into your home and let them begin to pray for you. Find that person that can be praying for you as well because we not only need to be fighting for our families, but we need to be fighting for each other. And if there's any place it needs to happen, it needs to happen in the church. It needs to happen in the church. We have to close the gaps. Where are the gaps in our relationships? Where are the gaps in our personal relationships? Where are the gaps that we need to be fulfilling and praying for others? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, 8. Let's go there for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now this, 13, verse 4. Now this is one of those passages that most of the time you'll hear at a wedding. But what I believe it does is it helps us understand how we can fight for our families. And it says this, love is patient. You want to talk about a healthy relationship? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. And here's what I know. I realize that maybe some of you are here this morning and maybe your spouse is not here with you because maybe they don't want anything to do with God and they don't want anything to do with church at this point. It doesn't mean that you can't live this out. It doesn't mean that you can't fight for your family. It doesn't mean that you can't attempt to strive to live under a biblical pattern that God has called us to. Because the Bible even says that if we live that way, it may happen that you actually lead your spouse to the Lord because of the way that you're acting. They fought for their families. 
The third thing is this, is that they focused on the strength of their roles. They focused on the strength of their roles. Some of the guys just had weapons and stood behind them and were there to fight. Some of them actually worked with one hand and had a spear in the other hand. Some of them filled gaps. And so we have to understand that if we're going to be in healthy relationships, especially in a marriage relationship, we have to focus on the strength of our roles. God ordained those roles. Okay, God ordained those roles. So if we go to Ephesians chapter five, God says this in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he goes on to say, and I know you don't like this part. Some of you don't like this part. Wives submit to your husbands. Maybe the structure of marriage is actually broken down because we don't live it in the way that God ordained it to. Okay, wives submit to your husbands. Now, um, now that doesn't mean for the husbands to, to, you're not a dictator. It doesn't mean you get to do whatever the heck you want and tell your wife whatever you want to tell her. Because let me tell you, that won't go well. (laughs) Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in in everything, okay? Now let me just make this one comment. Wives should submit to their husbands as long as it doesn't go against what God's word says. Okay? And it's not an option. It's like, well, God didn't say like, hey, if you want to. It was really a command, okay? Then on the other side, God also commanded us as husbands. He said, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing uh, with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or uh, any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, can you imagine for just a moment, if you're a husband, now you have to stand before God. God and you have to present your wife to God. It said that we are to present her holy and blameless before the Lord. Again, I realize that there are some of you here now that if your husband was to do that, he's probably not going to do that. Don't expect non-Christians to do what Christians should be doing. Okay. But we focus on the strengths. How can we celebrate the strength? If you, if you have an, an unbeliever as a spouse, how can you celebrate the strength and, and affirm them in what they do well? How often are we speak, speaking affirmation into each other instead of just saying, man, you didn't take out the trash today. Yeah. You didn't do this and you didn't do that and you don't do this and you don't do that. What if we actually affirmed each other more than we discouraged each other. Next thing is this, they equip themselves with the right tools. If you're going to walk in a healthy relationship, you have to equip yourself with the right tools. That's the one thing that I believe when I talk to couples that are getting married, hey, listen, you have to put healthy things into place now. You have to put healthy things into place now. You have to equip yourself with the tools that help you. They knew what they needed as they were rebuilding the wall. They knew the things that they needed to rebuild the wall. We know the things. God has given us the things and the tools that we need to have healthy relationships. We just have to make the decision that we're going to be equipped with those types of things. You're like, well, what are they? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take up your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting with your spouse. You're fighting against the enemy. We fight 
against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world and against the forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the best breastplate of righteousness in place with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Boom. God just gave you what you needed to equip yourself. Moving forward, knowing that the enemy's after you. And the last thing is this, is that they showed up and they did the work. They showed up and they did the work. They were, some of them were there day and night. You realize, he said, they didn't even go change their clothes. Because sometimes if we're not careful, if we open the door to the enemy, he'll come in. If we even open a door, and and, and I'm afraid that in a lot of our marriages, we're opening, we're just opening the door in a small way to let the enemy have a little bit of a place. And when you open the door to the enemy, a lot of times it gets pushed further and further open. And then all of a sudden you don't even recognize that he's come in. They showed up. They did the work. I hate it when people say marriage is 50-50 because it ain't. It's 100-100. It's everything you got. Because the enemy is going to do everything he can to try and destroy you and to tear your marriage up. The culture is trying to do everything it can to destroy your marriage. And if you show up, a healthy marriage happens by intentionality. You don't just walk into it like, oh, I got a healthy marriage. It's, It's kind of like when in January you decide you're going to work out. If you don't go to the gym, you're not going to get healthy. If you're not going to take the time to eat right, you're not going to get healthy. If you're not going to have a, you're not going to have a healthy marriage if you don't intentionally take time to build that into your relationship. Teenagers, I'm talking to you too. Kids, I'm talking to you too. If you have any desire to ever want to be married, what you have to know is start to build healthy systems now. Because it doesn't help happen by accident. So my question is, what is your marriage built on? The interesting part is a lot of marriages, they start being built on physical things. At the beginning of it, most marriages are built on physical things. And so my question to you this morning is, what is your marriage built on? You see, there's a story in Matthew chapter 7 where it says that there was one man who built his house on the sand. And then there was another man who built his house on the rock. And when the storms came and the winds blew and the rain blew, the house that stayed standing was the house that was built on the rock. If we want our families, parents, influence your kids by showing them healthy relationships and you won't do that if you don't unpack the baggage don't keep don't keep dragging this along behind you and and here's what I'll say about that most of the time it's the men who have the problem with baggage women they're 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 fairly easy at talking about stuff that's going on that's why women say 15,000 words in a day and men say five But we've always been taught as men, right? The male gender was always taught. You don't talk about your feet. You don't have feelings. You don't cry. You don't do this. You don't do that. You're a man. You're, you're a man's man. You blah, 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 blah. Just because you're talking about the junk of your life, it doesn't make you any less of a man. It just, what it does is it opens the door more to the enemy. And if you want a healthy relationship, deal with the baggage. I had to do that. I had to do that. 
Early on in my, early on, I had to, I, Ashley and I had probably been married for 15 years. And I had to unpack the baggage in my life because I realized that there were some things that were unhealthy and I had to unzip it and I had to, and I had to show it to Ashley. And that was the suckiest thing I ever had to do. But what it did from that point forward is it started us on a different trajectory to a more healthy place. And now because of that, I believe we've been able to paint a picture for our kids of health in relationships. So what are the healthy parts? I don't, I don't want you to feel like, oh man, I, my relationship's awful. Because you probably have some healthy parts in your relationship. But then on the other side of that, what are the unhealthy parts? What's one thing that you can add? Listen, I don't, I don't expect you to walk away from here today and like you're going to go out at gangbusters and you're going to do all of these things. No, just pick one. Just pick one. And some thoughts I have for that is what, what is prayer and scripture? How does it play a part in your relationship? What about forgiveness? What about forgiveness? You see, because if you haven't unpacked the baggage, it's hard to forgive. What about communication? Communication that helps lead, helps you navigate conflict. That, that leads to regular affirmation. I didn't say fight with your family. I said fight for your family. What about time? Are you making time for your relationship? Quality, quantity? I think there has to be a rhythm of both. Quality is important, but so is quantity. The both can go hand in hand. And what about counseling? Do you need help? Seriously, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you need help, you need to get help. You need to find help. You need to find the right help. There are a lot of crazy counselors. You need to find the right biblical counseling to help you start to navigate through these things. Because if you don't, if you don't, eventually when the bag is opened, it'll be, it'll explode. And I told you guys that what happened with my parents for some 60 years, three years was that they just stuff stuff in the bag and they just stuff stuff in the bag and they never actually dealt with some of the stuff and eventually as they got older it just exploded and I truly believe that it killed my parents because they were taught in the church listen listen they were taught in the church you don't expose the baggage and the reality of it is, is that nowadays, most of us have stuff that we need to deal with. Every one of us. And so don't feel like you can't work through the stuff that God may be revealing to you this morning. So here's what I, we want to do. We've done this for the last three services. And I'm going to ask Ashley to come on up. You can still hold baby girl too. It's okay. For those of you who don't know, this is my wife, Ashley. I had to bribe her to come up here. No, I'm just kidding, because she doesn't like this part. Um, but if you will, if you're married, would you stand, even if your spouse is not here, would you just stand with me this morning? And I want, I want to pray over you this morning. Take the, hand of the, take the hand of your spouse. You have to hold hands every now and then. It's okay. Even in church, it's okay. And I want us to pray together. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Will you take a moment and will you pray for your spouse? Even if they're not here, will you take a moment and will you just pray for them?
Now will you pray for another couple and for someone else's marriage? Maybe it's somebody that you know that's going through a difficult time. Maybe it's your own kids. Would you just pray for them? Would you fight for them for just a moment? Now would you ask God to help all of us build foundations of faith to make Jesus, even if you're sitting down, to make Jesus the foundation of our life. Pray against the enemy and what the enemy is trying to do to get a foothold in your relationship. God, I just thank you and praise you for who you are. God, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross so that we might have forgiveness and the hope of salvation. I thank you for your word that shows us what it's like to have a foundation of faith for our families, for our marriages, for our kids. And God, I pray that as your church, we would build our lives and our families on the foundation of Jesus and his word. I got to pray against anywhere that the enemy may be trying to get a foothold or anywhere that any husband or wife in here have opened a door um, to the enemy. God, I pray that today it would be slammed shut. I pray that if there are any cycles or any patterns that have been created that are not biblical, God, I pray that today those cycles would be broken. I pray that divorce would be broken. And I pray that healthy marriages would come out of this. I pray for those who are hurting today because they have a broken relationship. God, I pray that there would be husbands, that there would be wives that would come to Jesus and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. I pray that encouragement would come to those who are widows who have lost their spouses. I pray for those who have a desire one day to be married. God, I pray that you would help them to begin to build a foundation. I pray for anyone who may be in an unhealthy relationship that they're not supposed to be in, that they would have the boldness to step away and say, no more. I will not be unequally yoked. God, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We give you glory and honor and praise. I pray for that marriage who's ready to quit. God, that today you'll strengthen it. That you'll strengthen it. That you'll show up and do what only you can do. And as that song said that we'll see you do things that we'll you're doing things that we don't see in Jesus name we pray amen let's sing this last song together